can we get back to the <laughs> the flow plan now and start the next session which is on financial market structure and um, we've had uh, reasonably drastic changes in this session uh, but uh, the thing that I'm going to do now is going to be a little proactive the um, chairperson is not here yet so I'll be acting moderator slash chairperson for the session until Josh Feldman comes in and what I'm going to do is uh, say that Yesha gets to present her paper first if she doesn't have a problem with that Yesha the floor is yours You've got 15 minutes, and then your discussion comes in. Uh, will Gabriel uh, Rothberg please make himself? That's Gabriel. Okay. Uh, the chairperson would like to shake your hand at the start of the session. OK. Gabriel was supposed to go up first, but Yesha t takes precedence because she's organizing the conference with us. Uh, so I'm uh, giving up my chair as temporary uh, chairperson. Josh Feldman is here. And we'll start the session. Yes, here we go. Um, and what, what, what's, what's the order, Susan? Who, who's going first? OK, so, so first we have the redoubtable <laughs> Yesha Yadav. Uh, if, if you don't know her now, very soon you'll have a, a taste of the Yesha experience. Uh, she's a professor of law at uh, Vanderbilt. And she was an honorary advisor to the FSLRC, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, uh, so that's right. Um, soon you'll get to see a whole lot more awesomeness. Uh, and then, then who's next? Okay, then we have uh, uh, Gabriel Rauterberg, who's from the University of Michigan Law School, I believe. Is that? Okay. Uh, cause he, he, um, and then uh, we have his colleague, Vic Kana who's not only from the University of Michigan Law School, but he is the co-director of something called the Joint Center for Global Corporate and Financial Law and Policy. <laughs> and he has a brand new Yeah, Oh no, this is bad, this is not appropriate. Jyoti, Unnati, and others for uh, making this incredible program happen uh, yet again. Uh, more than anything, um, it is such a fabulous, uh, fabulous uh, opportunity for me uh, to come back to Bombay, uh, to have the chance to see old friends again, and of course, to make new ones uh, this time around again. Uh, so thank you so very much for having me, and it's such an uh, honor and a privilege to be part of this uh, session in particular. Uh, all right, so I thought that given that we are coming towards the end of 2017, um, I thought that we might celebrate, right? I thought we might celebrate the wonderful Indians that have gone abroad, made a wonderful name for themselves, succeeded, and brought terrific pride in India, right? So I thought we might celebrate a little, uh, given where we are in the year. So here, of course, we have Sundar Pichai, wonderful Google CEO, needs no introduction, terrific guy. Uh, then, of course, we have uh, Indira Nui, uh, CEO of Pepsi. Uh, again, a, a role model in corporate governance. And of course, most of all, best of all, uh, we have the following. <laughs> yes! <laughs> we have the following, the India's pride and joy, of course. Uh, but, uh, but, but, in the, uh, but, I, but, you know, uh, another leading light uh, that some of you may not have heard of uh, is this guy, perhaps famous for all the wrong reasons. Anyone know who this guy is? Let's not go with the poor Indian, right? This guy was, uh, this guy was Navinda Sarao, right? Navinda Sarao in 2010 was at that time a 36-year-old guy living out of his parents' basement in Northwest London. He was a really good Indian boy because at age 36 he was still living with his parents. Uh, <laughs> Don't know whether he was married or not, but I'm sure they were working on it. Uh, but anyway, so this guy, right, so this guy, uh, this guy somehow, right, was charged uh, by the U.S. Justice Department and the CFTC for undertaking a series of trades that eventually culminated in an 
event that came to be known as the flash crash, right? This was an event where the Dow Jones stock index dropped almost a thousand points in just a couple of minutes, wiping out over a trillion dollars worth of value. Uh, and it was courtesy of this guy, right? And the big question is, how did this guy, right, this nerd living out of his parents' basement in London managed to crash the U.S. stock market in a matter of minutes. The interesting thing about Navinder Sarai was that his behavior was well known. Right? This guy was a well-known troublemaker on the exchanges in which he was operating. Right? He was active on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange in the U.S. The CME. And the CME knew really, really well right, that this guy was a troublemaker. Uh, in the media, he was called the Hound of Hounslow. Right? The Hound of Hounslow was in action. And this guy, right, the CME had sent him numerous notices telling him, yo, dude, stop misbehaving. What are you doing? Right? So this guy was well known as a troublemaker. But the key issue here was that despite knowing this fact, the CME took no action at all to actually uh, expel him from the exchange, eventually meaning that he was free to cause the trouble that eventually culminated in the event that was the flash crash, right? So this was Navinder Sarau. And what this incident really seeks to hi highlight, right, is the incredibly important role that exchanges play in modern markets and making sure that markets are able to operate in an orderly fashion, right? It really draws into extremely sharp relief, right, the critical role that exchanges play in making sure that marketplaces are free of fraud, manipulation, and bad behavior, right? Um, and really what this paper is about uh, is arguing that in today's modern equity market in the US, exchanges are just not able to play this all-important role of being good overseers of market governance, potentially at a cost to capital allocation more broadly. But if we think about it from the biggest 36,000 feet perspective, Right? If exchanges are not able to do their job, if exchanges are not able to properly police the marketplace, then arguably investors have to absorb that cost. Right? Investors have to internalize right? the cost, the burden, the expense of undertaking that self-protection, potentially discounting what they put into the market and maybe reducing or limiting completely their participation in the market altogether. That really is the thesis of this paper. Now, what's interesting is, right, here are his parents. These are Navinda Sarau's suffering parents. I have to honor them and put them up on the, on the presentation. Uh, so uh, so the, 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 uh, the interesting thing in the US, right, US law really recognizes in the law the extremely critical place of exchanges as private overseers of the marketplace, right? It is embedded in the US regulatory system, right? According to the law there, exchanges are required, right, to enforce all the securities laws in the books, right? Exchanges are required to implement, monitor, and make sure that people comply with industry norms and standards, right? And if we think about it, right, it makes complete sense that exchanges should do this, right? It makes perfect sense that exchanges should do this. Right, exchanges are, the quintessential exchange, is a place that brings together all these different traders under one roof. Right, if you think about films like Trading Places, right, with Dan Aykroyd and Eddie Murphy, everyone sort of wearing their horrible jackets, swearing, you know, shouting, hairy guys with their crazy jackets. You know, this is what exchanges do. Right, exchanges bring the entire ecosystem of traders within, uh, within, uh, within their institution and under their roof. And these network effects have enormous uh, disciplinary consequences. Right? Everyone wants to be a part of the exchange. Everyone wants to be able to utilize the resource of the exchange to be able to actually be a part of the market. And this means that the disciplinary power of exchanges is really, really effective. When everyone wants to be part of the group, they're going to behave themselves, 
rational traders will behave themselves, right, in order to survive and not be subject to exchange discipline, right? And so the disciplinary power of exchanges is something that is very much a, a part of the U.S. Uh, market structure for uh, the key for the reasons that exchanges have incredibly powerful persuasive network effects. Um, and really, uh, what's interesting though is that this sort of consolidated aspect of exchange design has obvious uh, faces an obvious tension with the goal of ensuring that there's competition in the provision of trading services. But if exchanges are monopolistic or olig oligopolistic providers of trading services, then arguably they can derive good rents from the, from the fact of their position. Right? Exchanges can be, uh, can be in a position to charge high fees. Exchanges may be in a position not to be able to compete in a manner that is the most optimal. And what US regulatory policy has really focused on over the last decade or so is in, is in encouraging competition in the provision of trading services. Right? So under this regulation, Regulation ATS, uh, uh, US regulatory policy has encouraged right, the creation of these off-exchange trading venues to trade at US equities um, that have colloquially been come to, where they colloquially come to be known as dark pools, right? You guys all know this. Uh, dark pools basically are a creation of US regulatory policy designed to make sure that exchanges are facing competition in the provision of trading services and not able to derive rents from the fact of having a, mon a monopolistic or oligopolistic position in the marketplace. Right? And what's really, really, really interesting right, about the dark pool is that even though dark pools can trade U.S. equities, they are not subject to the requirement that they provide discipline and oversight of the marketplace. Dark pools do not have to undertake the discipline, the public oversight function that exchanges provide, right? Dark pools do not have to do this, which means that dark pools, even though they can trade equities, Right, are under a much lower compliance burden because they do not have to provide the oversight function and therefore they can be competitive, low cost, nimble, right? And that is a reason why they have succeeded enormously over the last decade or so. Dog pools today have an incredible market share in the US, in the US market. They're around 40 or so dog pools. They now mediate around 40% or more of US equity trading volume. The New York Stock Exchange that once had 80% of all tra secondary market trading volume in its listed securities now only has around 20% or so of trading volume in its listed securities. And NASDAQ is at approximately 17%. And this 20 and 17% figure is actually much higher than the actual minute by minute volume uh, that, is, uh, that, is, uh, that is there on the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ, right? This includes, uh, this includes the volume that happens at the, close of, at the start of the day and the close of the day where there's a lot of traders coming into the marketplace on the NYSE and the NASDAQ. If you take volume, say at midday or at 1 p.m., the, the NYSE only has around 1% of all U.S. trading volume on U.S. exchanges and dark pools, right? That is minuscule compared to the 80% or so that it used to have. Five minutes! I haven't even got to my argument yet. Ah, uh, sorry. Anyway, I will speak really fast. So what this really means is, right, having these sort of network of, of 13 exchanges and 40 dark pools means that exchanges today are in a really, really tough position in trying to provide oversight of the market and being able to discharge their regulatory function as private overseers, right, of trading markets and the capital markets more broadly, right? Um, if we think about it, the first challenge is a logistical one, right? How can, one, how can an exchange, the NYSE or the NASDAQ, right, uh, keep track of the different traders that can move like fish between the 13 exchanges and 40 or so dark pools, right? Information asymmetry today is baked into the structure of U.S. markets, right? Exchanges today are now expected to keep track of traders as they flit between the 13 exchanges and 40 or so dark pools, meaning that an exchange has to be extremely determined, right, to be able to, uh, to, to the perform its role with great zeal, to expend the money it needs to discharge that task, 
And frankly, even then, it's likely to be impossible. One can certainly argue that maybe dark pools and exchanges can coordinate in the provision of oversight. Right? But if dark pools are subject to much lower compliance requirements, why do they have any incentives at all right, to help the exchanges to do their job? Right? Why should they even bother to come forward and help exchanges to do their job? They are subject to a much lower compliance burden, so why don't they just take advantage of that particular gain? Right? Moreover, you know, uh, what, what the, this sort of competitive pressure means is that exchanges today are much more sharply subject to that perennial conflict of interest they've always faced, right? That comes from being required to discipline those that give them business, right? That is a conflict of interest that you guys, as finance geeks, are all really familiar with, right? But this competitive marketplace, this fragmentation means that this conflict of interest is so much sharper. Right? Today, exchanges are providing their, uh, their traders with a lot of revenue gaining services like data, advisory services, and other things. Right? Revenues of the NYSE and NASDAQ have gone up, even though trading volume has gone down. Right? This creates a further disincentive to exchanges to actually exercise the discipline that they're supposed to. Right? Why would you want to be like Brian and come first at Harvard, or like you guys and come first in your class? Right? If, you don't, if you're going to lose all the business, right? If you're going to lose the business, including these revenue gainful services like data advisory and so on, right? That really provides so much revenue and benefit as a for-profit exchange. Two minutes, perfect. Right? Indeed, one can make the argument today that exchanges, in fact, have an incentive to underinvest in governance, right? Exchanges today have an incentive to underinvest in governance. Right? Arguably, they can reap gains for themselves right? if they're lax in providing governance. Right? They can create a marketplace where traders want to come. Maybe they can provide services at lower cost. Right? Maybe they can be a place where traders will come and try and get other products and services like advice and data and other things. Right? They can reap private gains by lax oversight because they share the cost of failure. Right? In a network of 13 exchanges and 40 dark pools, right, a mistake on your exchange reverberates across the network of exchanges as a whole. Right? So you're not fully internalizing the cost of failure as the NYSE and the, and the NASDAQ once did when they were sort of very dominant exchanges in the US market. That is not the case anymore. Right? So today, a mistake on your exchange, the cost would reverberate across the, across the marketplace. Finance studies are, are replete with data on how incredibly efficient today's markets are at transmitting information, but also at communicating the cost of error and mistake and disruption across the marketplace as a whole. Right? So you have a system in which these exchanges right, can gain from underinvestment because they're reaping private rents from lack of oversight and they're sharing the cost of failure because essentially the costs are shared uh, within this network of exchanges as a whole. Right, so to conclude, you know, this has some really deep consequences. This sort of governance gap, this governance deficit has some consequences for us, right, as we talk about capital markets, as we talk about governance, as we talk about how efficient capital can be in the marketplace, right? These guys are so well positioned to exercise discipline, and yet today, the market structure design that is prevalent in the US, right, makes it almost impossible for them to do this job, and furthermore, creates incentives for them not to do this job well, right? And ultimately, the costs are going to be borne from the perspective of capital allocation to the extent that investors are rationally discounting for this added risk, right, in the capital that they are investing, right? So um, just to sort of conclude, I guess, you know, we have sort of considerable room, I think, as a community to think about uh, ways in which we come up with solutions. Uh, to fill this governance gap, either through private oversight or by encouraging greater liability on the part of exchanges and dark pools, right, in the event that they fail uh, in their governance responsibilities. So I'll stop with that uh, and uh, move on to uh, the discussion part. So thank you all very much. Very plain discussion. Um, so, um, it was really a pleasure, um, and I'd like to thank, because Yesha was 
the one who actually invited me to discuss her own paper. So I'd like to thank her for choosing me. And uh, I learned a lot from reading this paper. So REC uh, ATS, like to go back not too long ago, uh, in history, ushering the new era of fragmentation in the U.S. stock market. And this paper basically argues that the exchanges in the ATS exercise less oversight to minimize fraud and manipulation. And the reason being that, you know, it is extremely costly, if not close to impossible, right, due to fragmentation to, you know, really be able to police and identify, you know, all these trades that go on in different venues. And on top of that, you know, the exchanges have minimal incentives to do so uh, because they bear all the private costs of monitoring, but the benefits will be shared by the entire uh, market that consists of over 40 different mm -hmm. trading venues, right? And as a result, you know, we have this uh, huge free riding problem, okay? And on top of that, you know, Yesha also proposes uh, some sort of like, you know, a solution to this particular problem. And she basically said maybe, you know, we should uh, invoke immunity that is given uh, to these exchanges, right? That they don't have to be liable for some of the frauds and manipulation that might take place in the exchanges, right? And, you know, kind of hold them accountable, right, for the, you know, failures that come from uh, that lack of oversight, okay? Uh, she also proposed some sort of collective liability structure that disperse from a share fund and so on that would help promote, you know, uh, policing uh, among themselves different trading venues and cooperation in sharing information that would help detect fraud and manipulation. So my thoughts, I mean, first of all, like I spent several hours reading the paper and uh, some other related uh, literature, and I learned a lot. Uh, I'm, I don't work in this area, so this is sort of a lot of, of new uh, information for me. It is a very comprehensive review, uh, though I think repetitive at times, so that makes it easier because I can skip a few paragraphs <laughs> here and there. Uh, review of the history and various intents of the law uh, and, and, you know, uh, actions by the government in establishing the national market system, right? Uh, the paper clearly articulates the governance challenges that are induced by fragmentation and proposes a pretty thoughtful and, and implementable uh, solution to fix a problem. From my financial economic uh, point of view, right, and I highlight that this is not from a legal perspective, you know, I do have a following questions. So first, my question is, is there really a decline in market governance, right? Mm -hmm. So Yesha identified that, you know, there's some sort of gap in governance that uh, should occur due to the, you know, the difficulty in, in policing this uh, fraud and manipulation and also the, the incentives, right, uh, of these ex exchanges. However, you know, there was really no evidence in the paper or being mentioned at all uh, that this actually occurred, right? All the examples of the fraud and manipulation given in the paper seem to actually come from the derivatives exchanges, CME, CBOE, and so on. And there really little fragmentation when it comes to, you know, exchange traded derivatives for these, you know, exchanges, right? And so it's not very clear that, you know, all these manipulations are actually induced by fragmentation as the paper seemed to argue, okay? Uh, there are also other examples being mentioned, like the Barclays uh, ATS system or maybe ITG's front-running problem and so on, but these are all be misbehaviors by the exchanges themselves, not really the traders who use these uh, different uh, dark pools, right? And so, as a result, it's not very clear to me that we are really having this kind of problem at all, right? Uh, although the economics seem to suggest that we do, okay? Uh, second, um, you know, Yesha highlights a lot of, you know, um, differences between dark pools and exchanges, uh, but it's not very clear to me reading the paper that whether, you know, the trading venues are dark or lit really matters, right? Imagine a world with 40 plus different exchanges versus the world with 10 exchanges and 30 plus different dark pools. Right? Would the operational and incentive challenges that we're facing in overseeing these markets be any different? Right? Is it really dark versus lit, or is it just fragmentation in general that creates a problem? Right? Uh, to convince readers 
right, that dark versus lit actually matters, maybe, you know, you can give examples of manipulation that can only be done, right, because some of these venues are dark. Right? If they're lit, then you know, this manipulation would not go undetected. Right? Uh, on top of that, it's not very clear that ATS being lightly regulated have such a huge you know, advantage over the exchanges, because if so, why is it that you know, IEX, for example, wanted to upgrade itself into an exchange? Right? And so you know, all of these together, I think, would help make the case more convincing if you can provide some uh, more concrete examples and, 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 and analysis of why uh, things moved the way they did. And finally, on the solution. So I think, you know, as economists, we tend to think that over-regulation is as bad as under-regulation, right? And so as a result, you know, it is true that if you impose exposed liabilities for, you know, manipulation and so on, uh, will induce the right incentive for you know, the, uh, the exchanges to try to police this behavior. However, the proposal still doesn't fix the problem that this oversight is going to become really costly, right? They have incentives to do it, but they're going to bear the cost of doing so, and as a result, they're going to pass on this cost to the end users, right, the traders. And so we're going to see higher fees, we're going to see higher trading costs in general. Now, we already have FINRA, and all the trade information is already collected there. Right? And I don't um, see why we can't you know, just charge FINRA with this extra one additional responsibility of trying to detect some of these fraud and you know, manipulations that might occur across different you know, 30 plus or 40 different venues that we have these days. Right? So um, you know, just not to go over time, so in conclusion, I learned a lot from this paper, and I hope that you know, my uh, discussions, which come from a different perspective, would be helpful at all. Thank you so much. Uh, all right. Uh, one. Uh, raise your hands again. Let's just go around. One, two, three, four. Go ahead. Okay. So I, I want to say two things. Uh, this is a, Yesha, this is a live and interesting issue in India. Uh, we have lived this. Uh, our story runs in three parts. First, there was the Bombay Stock Exchange, which was an exchange owned and managed by the securities firms. And we discovered that under our legal environment, the enforcement just didn't happen. We could not get uh, management composed of brokerage firms to detect and punish actions by brokerage firms. So that was like one endemic low-level equilibrium. Then came NSE. And uh, in the early years, there was this very clear self-conception at NSE, that the solution lay in breaking three distinct groups of people. One, who would be the owners of the exchange, the shareholders. The second, who would be the managers of the exchange. And the third, who would be the securities firms trading on the exchange. And the theory of change was that we give the managers low-powered incentives. The managers would get an income but not stock options. The managers would not have shareholding. So the managers would then be more comfortable doing a little more of the bureaucratic job of doing the regulation. And the shareholders would be the large uh, institutional investors who have more to gain from a liquid efficient market rather than from some measly dividends that come out of an exchange. Okay, so this was a very clear theory in the early years of NSE. Unfortunately, many pieces of it have not survived. Okay? And part three is we had an experience with a new exchange that came along which was all out and out, high-powered incentives chasing profit, which ended badly. Okay, so we in India have lived this story very clearly and we constantly struggle to find that machinery through which an exchange is actually a front line of regulation. And here in India, there is a different perspective why you actually like to do that, because it is so difficult to create state capacity at a regulator. So it's very difficult to make a competent regulator. If you can have a clean contracting out to an exchange, and if you can construct incentives at an exchange correctly, then that's actually the best of all worlds, particularly in a low capacity environment here in India. I'll stop here. Uh, so Yesh, I really enjoyed the paper. Uh, and I do think that maybe the time for removing the, uh, the immunity if exchanges is over, but sort of in line with, with the discussant's comments, 
maybe it's time for a universal industry self-regulator, right? Maybe it's time for one regulator, FINRA, to take over all regulatory responsibilities, as it increasingly does anyways, just because it enjoys a variety of economies in a highly fragmented market. If somebody's engaging in misconduct across venues, any single venue doesn't have great incentives to try to track all of that behavior. So FINRA might be the right place to put all of this, and that might mean that, you know, a, one possible conclusion for your paper is, let's think about removing the self-regulatory organization immunity from all of the exchanges, have them regulated like ATSs, and have a much more robust one industry self-regulator in FINRA. Uh, Isha, perhaps an extension of your uh, discussion would be on uh, off-exchange positions. Uh, if you go back to the classic um, uh, SEPI and uh, uh, Kumar RFS 1992 on trade-based price manipulation, they talk about on exchange positions that manipulate the price for large profits off exchange. And so perhaps uh, if you're thinking about an overarching regulator, um, you need to worry about trades that happen in organized markets, but also off exchange positions of players where a lot of the profits are actually made when it comes to trade based price manipulation. The last. So I was actually thinking on my feet sort of what you could do if you wanted to keep this story about dark pools and governance. I think there's a very easy thing you can do. FINRA makes all dark pool data available, and you may actually have a point uh, to test on whether the reference, the stale reference prices from dark pools are being used in the lit exchanges, and that's just deepening the crisis, that big steep drop that we saw, because we knew, know there's feedback from the lit exchange to the dark pools and vice versa, and it should be very simple to test that. So that was all. Yesha? I just uh, wanted to say, first and foremost, a thank you to very much to Pep for such an excellent discussion. Um, and of course, for all the comments uh, that have followed. I mean, the discussion was fantastic, so I really appreciate uh, your efforts uh, in going through it so carefully. Um, I think some of the, yeah, I think the comments are great. Um, you know, I think one of the issues with FINRA, at least in the, um, in the literature, has been that historically it's been a perceived as a fairly lax regulator. Um, so there's been, a, there's been a lot of discussion um, about FINRA basically not exercising the kind of discipline, the stringency that would have been um, considered optimal, particularly from an ex post fact pers factor perspective. And this has been with respect to um, sort of actions taken against broker dealers uh, against which it has the primary jurisdiction. One of the interesting things this, that happened last year is that FINRA does have oversight here. Um, is that the NICE decided to uh, do it independently. So whereas other, uh, other exchanges like NASDAQ and other like IEX and others delegate to FINRA, the NICE said that we don't want to go through FINRA anymore and we're going to do our own regulation. So NICE regulation was born last year. And again, obviously that leads to issues that you and Gabriel identify, which is to say, look, it's fragmenting this one consolidated oversight because individual exchanges think they can do it better, but of course they have these incentive issues um, and so the question is, how do we deal with that? And I think these are all great, you know, really difficult issues to think about uh, in this regard. Um, I completely agree. I'll put some more examples, uh, particularly trade price, price manipulation that would, uh, that would enhance the case. Um, I think one of the real difficulties I have, and this is why I love being at finance conferences, is that it is extremely difficult empirically to prove these issues. Um, how do you do that? What kind of you know, identifiers can you use to, to think about a decline in governance? Anecdotally, what has happened is that many um, investors have formed their own dark pools. So if you, um, I think, you know, as Kumar was talking about in the bond market, what we've seen is an asset managers like BlackRock and T. Rowe Price and others have gone off and formed their own dark pools. There's one particular notable one called Luminex, ironically, um, that, uh, uh, that is basically a collection of asset managers because they feel uncomfortable in the trading environment in the sort of broader lit exchanges. And I think obviously the, 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 the challenge with that is, is that so much informed trading is now potentially taking place outside of lit exchanges. And as Badisha identified, what's the impact on the lit exchanges more broadly? And I think all of those issues are really hard to deal with. Um, and so, you know, I'm so happy and grateful for insights that I get from you guys because this is what you guys do best. So thank you so much for, for all these comments.